the bit density per square inch of RAM. And because it doesn't require power, a hundred times the density on a module. So it's not flash as a faster disk drive that's made solid state all that important. It's the fact that flash is a higher density memory device that has really made for a, a big change in the So enterprise. translation meaning it's really now cost effective. It's very and, cost and effective. It costs less than RAM yeah. per bit and you can pack a hundred times the density. On one module, you can get 800 gigs. On one card, up to five terabytes. And it's persistent. Now you, you're right, you could have you know, created battery backups before, but it's a lot cheaper to do it with flash. Yeah, and, and even if it were not persistent, even if it forgot the data, just as a memory device, it would be huge. But the added bonus of the fact that it remembers the data when the power's off is extremely powerful because now you don't have to wait for all that time for the, for the data to load in. I mean, some of these scale out properties like you were talking about have to stage a database and run traffic against it for several hours before it's ready to go live because they have to warm up all of the cache in, in the RAM. With uh, Fusion IO, IO memory, holding the data sets, you can go live and it's instantly ready because the data has been persisted there. So what does that mean for a, a, an application developer, say developing cloud applications? So it, it's a totally different mentality because things that you thought were impossible to do are now possible. You have to ask yourself, what would I do if I had a system with terabytes of memory uh, and uh, didn't have to wait for that to get restored after a power outage, but it was holding it all the time. The fact that this is a hybrid uh, memory slash storage device uh, makes for some really interesting designs. You can start combing through massive amounts of data in exhaustive ways that would not have been feasible before. David, can you can you talk about some proof points around the applications? I mean, obviously, you know, it's like having RAM in a PC back in the old days, right? It's, like it's all on, on demand there. What are you seeing from your business and that you're disrupting and some proof points around you know, that's a very Those interesting, new things. it's an interesting question because it spans such a large spectrum because we're talking about a fundamental new building block, right? So it impacts uh, and will impact every everything in the entire data center. But we can take out some for key examples. Um, in the database world, like we were talking about, it typically means that a, a database server can do about 10 times the throughput for the same server. Um, and those responses, the queries, are answered 30, 40% faster. So it means faster page loads, more throughput per server. So answers.com uh, retrofitted their MySQL scale out database tier and saw nine times the throughput per server. What they chose to do was to shrink the database farm uh, four to one. So they got a 75% consolidation. And with that remaining one out of every four servers, they were still getting in total, more than twice the throughput they had before. So they re-architected essentially their database platform. Right. And you know, one way to think of what we do is we sell server consolidation, just like VMware, but our server, we do that on the data intensive end of the spectrum, yeah. where it requires such a large data set or such fast access that it wouldn't all fit in RAM, it wouldn't all fit in spindles. Well, you know, we, we cover uh, a lot of, about data on SiliconANGLE and Dave researches with Wikibon. You know, everyone's talking about big data, you know, Hadoop's of the world, and, yep, but yep. there's little data. We've been teasing out this notion of little data. Low latency, fast response times, edge devices well, like. With virtualization, little data becomes big data because you can pack <laughs> as many workloads as, as you want exactly. to on a system. You, you got fast big data. <laughs> at that point because now you've jumbled all the I.O. together. <laughs> so you're fast, big data. That's right. right. So that's right. a good way to think about it? Fast, big data, and in combination with VMware, what it allows you to do is to further increase your consolidation ratios. Because what, what limits the number of virtual servers or virtual desktops you can fit on a single machine um, is the memory capacity required and the I.O. performance required. This fits both of those bills and so allows you to completely remove those as constraints. So, so talk about what that would mean, just playing it forward, just kind of, you know, the fantasy, you know, in a couple of years. I mean, everyone's talking about VDI, virtual desktops, and the end user experience, but people have iPhones and iPads. So, so what is that experience going to be? I mean, Spectrum is a problem for wireless and everyone wants faster everything now. So to explain that enablement. What would, what would be some of the things you'd see? So what we're seeing is that Flash is transforming your, your endpoint devices, right? So you're carrying around even more intelligent devices with more capabilities thanks to that, that very cheap capacity in the NAND Flash. 
um, and ever increasing processing performance. Where we play is in the back end infrastructure, what it takes to support those, to, to, to run those services in the sky. Um, this makes them much more cost effective to scale out. So it would be safe to say that you know my iPhone will be more powerful, my iPad will be more powerful? Those will be more powerful and they will appear more, you know, infinitely powerful because they're going to have fast access to large arrays of servers outfitted with, with I.O. memory that lets them hold huge So you're like a little memory data. cache that sits on the edge of the cloud that serves up the edge device, right? Um, Almost the way to think about it, it well, metaphorically? It, metaphorically, it sits in the cloud and it provides a new tier of memory. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't displace disk drives. You'll still use disk drives for the, uh, the cheap capacity that it gives you, but for your active data sets, uh, those will all be stored in I.O. memory. And so you'll still use RAM, but you won't have to put as much RAM per server because now it can access the, uh, the flash-based I.O. memory. So it's a new type of server class memory, really. It's a new type of server class memory. That is the exact way to put it. The fact that it happens to be non-volatile and that it happens to be accessed through the storage interfaces is really uh, a convenience. Um, just like a RAM disk, sets aside part of your memory to pretend to be a disk drive, um, this, um, actually it's our software stack called the virtual storage layer, takes I.O. memory and expresses it uh, as if it were a storage device. But the way it's physically connected, the way it's communicated with, is uh, much more uh, akin to how you communicate with memory. So John mentioned VDI before. Can you share with us any metrics or, again, more proof points around VDI and what you're, yeah, we're, you're seeing? Yeah, uh, we, uh, we set up for the show here a demo where we have um, 512 VDI desktops being served from a single server. And the amazing thing is that it's, it's CPU bound. It's a 48 core server, and uh, uh, we have, in essence, removed the bottlenecks of the amount of memory required and the amount of I.O. So it's, uh, you, know, you can even, you should stop by the booth and see it. You can log in through an iPad and start interacting with any one of those desktops. They're going through a scripted procedure showing users you know, very actively using the desktops. So we've talked about it, but I wonder if you could summarize sort of the difference between the Fusion I.O. approach um, very close to the, to the mm -hmm. CPU versus you know, taking SSD and mm -hmm. putting it into a, a disk controller-based subsystem. That's right. Um, the two general schools of thought. One is to have it pretend to be a disk drive and sit inside of the disk infrastructure, which seems like an easy target for very you know, quick deployment. That would be kind of like having flash chips. Uh, you know how you carry a USB thumb drive? Sure. Well, see, flash already displaced one form of magnetic media, the floppy drive. Notice it didn't replace the floppy drive by looking like a floppy disk and going in all those floppy disk readers. There was actually a company that did that and they didn't last very long because the USB port was just way too convenient to get more uh, capabilities. Um, well, we, we thought the same thing. Flash is a memory device and should be integrated into systems as a memory device to be able to, to truly exploit the additional capabilities, right? Because the last thing you want to do with a more, it's more expensive than disk drives Right? So you don't want to handicap its potential benefit. So we said, we should be focusing on how to optimize to extract the most benefit from the flash, not optimize to have it pretend to be like the old school stuff. Right. Can you talk a little bit about how you could uh, potentially share that resource? Is that something that's on the horizon? Well, you know, the, the, the thing is, is all storage starts local and gets shared out over iSCSI or Fiber Channel through some sort of a director or, or service. And you can take I.O. memory and serve it out iSCSI or, or put Microsoft or open source on it and have it out a filer. So it, anything that can serve storage over a network can serve IO memory um, virtual storage out over a network as well. So we're demonstrating uh, you know, iSCSI based targets, et cetera, downstairs. Now, it's best used locally because of the very high performance. We have cards that have the performance of 16 FC4 ports. So just one card, and it, it gets very expensive to try to extract that much. So you'll see a tendency, and it's very in line with cloud scale out, to have the storage local and have it used locally, even if you have a, a sharing layer of software. For example, Datacore, one of our partners, is here showing um, how with their software, they can create distributed shared SAN-like storage from servers that have IO memory under, um, under VMware ESX. Yeah, we had uh, George Teixeira on, on the show on Monday, I think. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah. good. Um, John, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about uh, David's business, about Fusion IO, the company. Yeah, um, I mean, what's going on with the 
status? What's the momentum you have? And great. So um, you know revenues as as <laughs> pause. I said <laughs> EBIT. That one. <laughs> <laughs> as you might expect, um, when you're introducing a, a new kind of building block that's this radically different. The, the question becomes, well, how do you drive adoption and make sure that, that there's traction with it? And you know, I, I'm happy to say that we have um, OEM wins with all three of the major server vendors. Uh, IBM sells our product under the name High IOPS, PCI Express. Um, it's actually designed into their WebSphere appliance, their web server appliance, and designed into their InfoSphere appliance, their database appliance, already built in. Um, and HP also has OEM the product. Again, sells it, sells it as if it were their own. Um, yeah. And it's called the um, the IO Accelerator, uh, and that's across uh, their server line. Um, and uh, most recently, just a few weeks ago, we announced an OEM relationship with Dell, uh, who uh, is actually uh, sharing our branding on the product. So it's a Fusion IO branded product, but it's a full OEM relationship with Dell. Dell also happens to be an investor in the company from our seed round investing. So you're going to run the table on the server vendors? I mean, this is a, you know, Dave and I were very excited that you were coming on, by the way, because um, we think your company is really hot in terms of like those well, huge you. success. So an IO is a problem, right? I mean, well, we, you all, know, we all want the faster edge b device. We figured that we had better um, uh, work well with the server vendors because what we're selling actually ends up being server consolidation, right? Yeah. And just like VMware had some of that, you know, constructive conflict with what does it mean to be consolidating servers, we have that same thing. So we felt it was very important that our products were um, were, you know, sold by the server vendors, and um, and allow them, them more, to make more, a good It business. gives them more performance. I mean, they can still right. serve their customers and, and deliver better value. And you know, the, the amazing thing is, is one might at first blush say, you're going to consolidate servers, that decreases the server spend. But in actuality, when you lower the cost per unit of useful computing, you make it more cost effective for uh, problems that weren't before, and now you can take uh, business models to market that wouldn't have been yeah. been viable. So yeah. it actually expends it, the it, overall it, IT. It's, this is something David Floyer from Wikibon has talked about a lot: that compute and storage resources. It's an elastic market. It's very right? elastic. Lower the price, people will buy more. They'll push applications so harder. So we may talk about consolidation, just like VMware, but what it really ultimately means is is expanding the overall market. So you guys are uh, obviously growing very quickly. Can you talk about headcount, you know, revenues? I mean, or even just give us some general <laughs> guidance. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the company is doing extremely well. Um, Waz we, is in there. Everyone wants to know about Waz. Steve, Steve Wozniak uh, uh, joined the company uh, now going on two years um, and is extremely active with the company. We're very pleased to have him. He's uh, aside from being a celebrity personality, um, I mean, dancing with the stars. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I great promotion. Did that. Yeah. yeah, but uh, <laughs> actually, that that happened just as he was joining up. Um, you know, he accepted. We, we thought we'd go out on a lark and ask him not just to you know be an advisor to the company, but maybe actually take a paycheck and be an employee and come in on a regular basis and be part of the executive team. And he accepted because um, he was That's so great. excited. Solid State has always been um, you know a special place in his heart. Um, but then he said but I'm going to be unavailable for the next three months because I'm going to be sequestered down in Southern California for this thing called Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> it's like, it worked out really well because now, you know, even people who don't recognize him for being the inventor of the Apple computer, they recognize him for being that guy on Dancing with the Stars. Uh, good. So, so the uptake is strong. Yes, it's, it's one of those up to the right charts, it sounds you know, like the, with you The guys. impact that it has on businesses is incredible. Um, we have some customers who are using us under autonomy and Microsoft's fast uh, unstructured text search. That's you know a growing area is corporate kind of search discovery, and you know their uh, improvements are incredible. They went from minute level response times to comb through the inventory of every last you know email, what have you, down to um, fractions of a second in the response time. So it, it can really change the business and the services that they provide. So we're seeing a, a very rapid uptake. So the reason I think, this is my personal opinion, that companies like Fusion IO uh, are so interesting is because not only are you attacking the efficiency play, consolidation, right? It's a big, big theme, mm -hmm. VMware, big theme. But more importantly, and this is true I think for VMware as well, um, helping IT become a, a value producer, right? Uh, yeah. Whether it's a revenue generator or a new business enabler, and from your standpoint, it's enabling orders of magnitude 
greater application performance, potentially. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. And, and we kind of segment it too. There's folks who want to use our product as a way to reduce cost and, and improve efficiency. The, uh, the more forward-looking guys are actually uh, the ones who look at the creative ways of, you know, now that this possible, now that this is possible and cost effective, what kinds of things can I can I do that that, that I couldn't before? And it means thinking outside the box. Just more tactically, what, what worries you as a CEO? What keeps you up at night? Um, my biggest worries nowadays are around supply chain and, and, <laughs> and building stuff fast enough. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, it's a problem that we always said, hey, that'd be great to have. Well, it's still just a problem. <laughs> what, do you, what do you say, just a final question to uh, wrap it up, it is advice to other entrepreneurs. I mean, you've built a, a great growing business, um, great wins. What do, you, what do you tell other entrepreneurs out there? Uh, boy, uh, run with your dream. You know, go through, uh, analyze it well, uh, make sure you're targeting a, a good market, and just um, trust your gut on stuff, and and be a little bit of a non-conformist. I think that's what's really played well with us. As we said, look, you know, everybody else is trying to conform to those same drive bays and storage controllers, and we said, you know, that all needs to be rethought. And so, being uh, ambitious enough to take on daunting. Okay, task. David okay. Flynn, the CEO of Fusion IO, hot startup, exclusive coverage of VMworld 2010 Live, SiliconAngle.com. Thanks so much, we're here in theCUBE. Feel free to mingle with the uh, bloggers, and I'm sure they have a lot of questions. App developers really interested, probably, in all this. So thanks so much, yeah. Dave. Thanks, great. John. Great to have you on, David. Appreciate thanks, it. Dave. We'll be Thank right you. back. Thank you. Taking a break, we're going to have an analyst great. come on from uh, Wikibon.org and Juniper Networks to talk about networking and possibly some data on security computing, but or across the street at the Apple store, tons of trucks, tons of activity. Apple's got the big announcement. Uh, we're here talking to all the people making that happen. I mean, Apple does not exist without the cloud and the future of applications will not exist without the cloud, Dave. So it's an exciting day. We've had the CEOs of all the top companies here, VMware, top executives. We had startups with entrepreneurs. We had industry analysts talking about cloud and the impact of cloud computing. And, and to me, cloud computing is about enabling a new generation of applications, a new generation of, of entrepreneurship, new cool stuff. So Apple epitomizes that. Apple is about the app store, about entrepreneurs built, spinning up an app on Amazon or a cloud service. And now enterprises all want app stores. So VMware powers that, powers that new generation. So you know, what is your assessment of how the Apple news and just cloud in general. Well, I think that you know, to me, I've been following the industry for a while, and and it's we're we're in the vortex of the wave. It's great to be here with Silicon Angle and Wikibon. David Floyer is on with us, and we cover this stuff. This wave to me was started by Google, right? But the interesting thing about this is previous waves were defined by monopolies. This one is is not right. The monopoly is maybe more. You know, subtle. There's no so, Microsoft anymore. I mean, so yeah. companies like VMware can ride that wave and you know create some kind of virtual. VMware is uh, that uh, new bottom. player. VMware is the new company that no one's really ever heard of outside of the tech business. It's emerging as the critical player that powers all this virtualization, which is you know huge power to like phones to PCs. And you got companies like EMC, power in the storage, using I.O. I mean, it's just amazing, and Apple, game changing. Right, Apple is just amazing. You know, you're seeing stuff with Android, it'd be interesting to see how that's going to play out. But so we have David Floyer here. David, you've been, you've been walking the show, uh, you follow this business, you, you've, you've done servers and storage and infrastructure and applications for years. What are you seeing at the show? What are the high points that you're seeing? Share with us. Well, uh, I think the, uh, following on what you were Please saying, uh, well, following on what you were saying about uh, the change in the industry, it's the platform that's now the crucial thing. And VMware is, es is establishing itself and extending itself in, in, in being the platform of choice for the deployment of cloud applications. What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you think VMware has to do, what's on its to-do list to really keep this momentum going? So, so there are two things that it's focusing on and has focused on this, uh, on, on, on this show, on, on this particular announcement. The first was the vCloud Director, and there what they're trying to do is make much more clear the division between virtual and real. So they're trying to def help define virtual data centers. Uh, virtual sets of resources and, and make them as building blocks that you create uh, whatever it is you want from 
all the resources around you and still maintain the control and, and availability and reliability and security that you require within a normal data center. And that's a big, big drive they have, very challenging one indeed. But so first of all, they're creating all of these virtual data centers from this pool and be able to allocate them out. And then the second starting uh, set of products is around VShield, which is trying to protect them. Crea creating, instead of having physical boundaries, having logical boundaries, virtual boundaries, and being able to have the set of resources. Just to start to begin with, with the VShield Edge, but obviously that's a very, very important uh, li uh, uh, line that they're on, because they've got to convince a very skeptical and conservative a group of people out there who do security that this is as secure as their, as their physical boundaries now, at the uh, moment. Now, hey, Bill Dave, you know, know what this is? This is Microsoft in, in, in a new bottle. I mean, VMware is laying out all this inner vShield, vCloud director. I mean, under that, the average user is going to get huge acceleration in new apps. Yeah, the huge benefits with power and compute power. I mean, your iPhone today, it's tiny compared to what's going to be. I think you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very Microsoft-like play in, in 2010 and beyond, right? Is Where VMware you, the next Microsoft in your eyes? Yeah, I think they're clearly taking the, the playbook, right? And you've got some executives that understand that playbook. <laughs> yeah. So the infrastructure, the platform, and, and, and even the applications, you know, I don't think I'm sold yet on the applications piece in Zimbra, but you know, the infrastructure and the platforms are really, to me, the two key legs of the pillar. And I think they have to enable applications, right? And that's what Spring Source is all about. And that's the right business for them An to be An application developer's got to make money. I mean, yeah, but we're right. hearing people want faster, they want everything now, these enterprises where people work, really no one's happy. I mean, we're hearing over and over again that the average user inside a company is really unhappy with their, yeah. now, with their and, uh, PC and device. Now I want to switch topics a little bit. Bill Cook from uh, Greenplum is in the house and we've been, you've been doing a lot of research on that. Why don't you give us a quick preview as to what you've well, been finding. Explain what Green Plum is. They were bought yes. by EMC. Yes, so Green Plum. <laughs> Green Plum is a, uh, uh, is, a, is a database and it's focused on uh, data warehousing and different ways of getting that data with uh, different architectures. And what EMC have bought uh, Green Plum and what they're looking at is how they can use their resources to use the uh, the great things about Greenplum, for example, um, the, the way it segments things, how they can map that on to their, their V blocks and their storage and really make the, uh, uh, Greenplum sing. And they've been doing some very interesting work. There's some very interesting market segment where Greenplum. Why did, why did EMC buy them out? Because you know, they were playing with a lot of open source players. I mean, why did EMC, what was. Well, guys, you guys are analysts. I mean, you got to know the inside, you know, deep stuff. What, what? Well, I mean, I'll give you my opinion is you basically EMC is a leader in, in business intelligence and data warehouse. And they what do position a ton are they in the market they, right they, now? They've got to be number one. They do a ton of business. Just and number one in storage virtualization? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so we, we just wrote about that, right? And the ESG data showed that. But I'm specifically talking about now uh, the business intelligence market. Just by the fact that they're so big in storage, they were doing a bunch of business there. Now you have companies like Oracle and Natiza coming in with new models that really threaten you know, the traditional model. EMC, I think, saw that as an opportunity for growth and, and defending its current base. What do you think? I, I think there are two things. A, I think it, it saw an undervalued company and a great opportunity to make some money uh, in, in the software business. But secondly, to learn with a database company on how they could connect it with storage, connect it with the, the V-blocks, and actually make them sing in a, in a, in a business uh, warehouse. Well, a lot, so, of, so John, a, lot of people, a lot of people are saying that the Green Plum sold out a little bit. You know, is that true? Green Plum what, sold out? Yeah, they yeah, sold EMC. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 sold out. Oh, the oh, CEO's sorry. in the house. So let's, bring, a, let's bring Bill Cook in. We have uh, and, and we had to get them all David, riled up. Thank you very much, appreciate right. it. Okay. Yeah, thanks thanks. You. Bill Cook, why don't you come on right in? We'll just stay live. CEO and, uh, of Green Plum, startup recently acquired by EMC. Great story. <laughs> we had to get them all riled up. Um, <laughs> This is uh, uh, put you right in the we're, seat, we're, yeah. We've been following these guys, and all of a sudden, you guys start and, and, swinging at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. 
Yeah. Good to meet you. Great, Great to meet you in person. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you. we've been following you guys when you guys started up, and obviously when EMC snatched you up, we were at EMC World, and, and we had Pat Gelsinger on, on the Cube, and right. I asked him specifically about some acquisitions, and he said there's some things coming, and then I find out that you know Pat really <laughs> likes the deal, and yesterday he was on, and you know, and so Pat Gelsinger is you know almost his one year. So I was only teasing you about selling out. You literally did sell to EMC, but uh, we were following you with some of the, in the some of the open source side as well. I mean, right. and we were on the analyst call, and I brought that up, and you addressed it. So, so first question: Talk about Green Plum. What happened? You, what, how, what, <laughs> what evolved for the folks out there? Your company sold to EMC. Take us through that quick story, and we'll get into yeah, it. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the uh, obviously the condensed version here. Uh, Green Plum was founded, uh, you know, almost ten years ago, actually, uh, uh, by Luke Lonergan and Scott Yara. And the whole premise of the company was, to their credit, was that data warehousing and analytics was going to explode over time and that uh, the predominant view of how data warehousing was done at that time was around Teradata, and then at that time Natiza was coming on, uh, on board as well. But it was this integrated proprietary hardware platform with software to solve a specific, you know, what I, I would say is a niche problem of, of data warehousing. And a lot of times the CIO would be upset about that box coming into their environment because it was a proprietary box, didn't fit into their, into their architecture of what they were trying to do. And so the simple premise was, if you believe this is going to be a big market and not, and not stay you know, smaller or niche oriented, that history will prove that a software only play is the right, is the right direction. And so that's the premise of the company. Uh, now, the challenge with that is building a world-class MPP database engine is non-trivial, right? And, and so there's just no shortcuts to hiring great people and getting kind of the world's best talent assembled in a room to go tackle that. And get some proprietary technology and do all that great stuff. Yeah, and so we took Postgres as the underlying database from your, the open source uh, uh, question at the beginning and, 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 and kind of ripped out the innards, if you will, to, to make it work in this MPP scale out architecture way. And so uh, that's what Greenplum is about. And so the, uh, we came to market in 2006 and, uh, and I guess the controversial decision, I hired in in 2006, my background was Sun, I'd spent 19 years at Sun, and so the controversial decision we made, normally at a startup you start small and then grow your way into the market. Right. And we felt this market was going to explode quickly and that we had to take on, and our software was built for the world's largest uh, data warehouse analytic environments. And so we went after the largest enterprise environments in the globe, and as a startup, that's a, yeah, that's, a big a challenge. that's a challenge and that's a tricky proposition. Now, the lucky break we got, a, as we say, and this is a bit ironic, was that Sun Microsystems, under the, the leadership of Jonathan at the time, uh, had a box coming out called Thumper that Andy Bechtelsheim had designed and was looking for more applications and solutions that they could build on top of that. And so uh, he got introduced to Greenplum at the time, and, and, and to their credit, they quickly uh, embraced Greenplum as part of their data warehousing strategy. And so that was the break we needed because that gives you credibility to show up in larger enterprise clients and have a bigger vendor behind you. And so that's how we went to market in 2006. Uh, uh, going after these, these enterprise uh, uh, class customers. So, and so the, much, the last three years have been focused on building building that customer base and proving our technology in their environment. How so much was EMC pay for you guys? Uh, was that disclosed? That, that was not disclosed. <laughs> you don't you want to disclose it in the cube right now? I, I, I don't want to disclose so it. I'll, I'll let disclose Pat or, or <laughs> Joe or someone One of my that. clients. Uh, I, I would say we, we were undervalued. <laughs> of course. One of my clients described uh, their problem in you know, the data warehousing business intelligence problem and they, they used the metaphor of a snake swallowing a basketball. <laughs> and it sounds like that's the business that you guys are really in, is helping address that, that challenge. Yeah, I, and, and I would characterize it a little bit differently, uh, but, I, but I think the analogy somewhat holds. I mean, I, I think what's coming at, at, at every enterprise around the globe is, is the notion that you know, data is critical to their future. And, and, and not just taking extracts of data. Uh, if you look at you know, everything around the room here, uh, everyone interacting with the internet. Uh, every one of those interactions contains some data that's probably useful to the business. And so historically, data warehousing has been about extracting the data and, and doing an extract or, or, or a summarization of that data and then looking for insights in more of a batch-oriented way. 
Uh, we think that world's changing dramatically. It's like looking back in the rearview mirror. Yeah, right? it's looking I mean, in the rearview yeah. mirror for kind of trends and, 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 and analysis. And so we, we believe that you have to take much more of an internet scale, agile kind of approach to data warehousing. That's, that's the big change that's going to happen. And what's underneath that change is that the advent of commodity hardware, if you think about you know, multi-core technology, uh, the storage technology that, that EMC and others bring, bring to the equation, and then the advancement of, of uh, interconnect and ethernet, so 10 gig ethernet, et cetera, those things have been advancing at, at, at a tremendous pace over the last 20 years. And yet data warehousing and analytics is still viewed as this big batch environment. And so what we believe is that the scale out being very agile from an analytics perspective will be the way that businesses start to do business. This won't just be about a data warehouse technology. Uh, this will be about how do I plug in to the existing infrastructure, and that's why it's timely here with, with obviously VMware and what's Bill. going on, to, to leverage a virtualized stack to allow data warehousing workloads to drive business value to, to customers. We, ha we had uh, a guy from Excel Partners, big VC, invested in a company called Cloudera um, that does a lot of Hadoop, commercializing Hadoop, and you know, big clusters of commodity hardware you mentioned. What, you got the big data argument. We just had Fusion IO, they talk about you know, fast, big data. Sure. What, what, what's your vision around this whole movement? I mean, you're right, Facebook is throwing off more data, people's uh, gestural data, what do you call it? Whatever you want to call it, I mean, you know, it's being used. I mean, Dallas Cowboys are using data from real-time data around promotions, concessions. So this business policy around data is very valuable. So talk about the Hadoop kind of world, the big cluster farms, um, we were talking on a session earlier about you know power is going to be a big issue. It's going to be massive clusters. Sure. And you need agility and speed, low latency data transfer. So where does that open source community fit in, and where does that you know the big EMCs kind of fit into that? Well, it's like any of these big big movements along the way. So so first off, we believe in it. We embrace it. In fact, we did a, a, a MapReduce interface into our engine. Uh, we know uh, Mike Olson, the Cloudera guy, is pretty well. Great guy. He's a uh, great. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> stay tuned for us working together. So we, we, we don't think there's one answer to the question around big data, right? There's still going to be lots of SQL access. Top there's of going the first to be inning there? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. Totally top of the first inning. And I don't think it'll stop at MapReduce and Hadoop, right? There'll be other constructs as well. And so from our perspective, we're providing an engine for that to run on. And then it's about provisioning and how do you start to get collaboration across that data. So uh, uh, we are embracing that. You're excited about that. We're movement. very excited about that. And I think it fits in perfectly to where enterprises are going to go uh, with their big data problem. Can we talk a little bit about you know, the whole VMware play? Because I mean, a lot of the clients that I talk to say things like, we're not, we're not going to share this infrastructure. We need all the horsepower we can get. But we were talking earlier, and you actually see, especially for data marts and the like, a real big opportunity to, to virtualize that, that infrastructure. Yeah, so there's two, two, and that's a really good question. There's two points going on here. So one, the, the, the point about sharing infrastructure. So it's the same infrastructure that you can use for multiple applications. So we believe that world exists and will continue to exist if you think about my premise that people are going to look for access to all types of data and by the way you know at the beginning of the day they may not know what they're looking for right, right and right. so that evolves so you've got to yeah, have that, that sure. kind of ag agility uh, secondly uh, you're right uh, in a lot of cases when 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 you're looking at workloads for data analytics you want as much power as you can throw at it so we're not talking about turning that off we're talking about having a, a way to provision that automatically and have some user management around that. If, you wanna, if you've got a big problem you need to solve from an analytics perspective, you may want to throw a thousand cores at it and you know, 100 terabytes. But you also may want to scale that back tomorrow. Yes, right. right. And so when we talk about virtualized worlds, we're talking about being able to have that, that knob that you can turn to get that infrastructure and get that data quickly and then give the power to the user you know, with some management around that. The, obviously, security, authentication, all those things matter. And then having the, the kind of the business management over the top of that, of getting the right resources to the right users. Okay, so this is, you're feeling that, that, based on what you just said, that will resonate with application heads, right? Because you're going to make their lives a lot better, more resources faster. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a funny world because in, in data warehousing, if you talk to most enterprises, from a user community perspective, they'll say, it's really hard. I'm not happy with my CIO. I'm not happy how I get access to my data infrastructure. I say I want a, a 100 terabyte data mart, and three months later I may have it, yeah, right. right? And so what we're providing now is a bridge to the IT organization 
through partnerships like with VMware that you create these virtualized environments that people have access to. And now all of a sudden the business users are much happier, mm. right? They've never had that capability. And also give them that knob that they can turn up the power and the performance that they need and the access to the data sources that they need. That's the other problem we're solving for, is how do you do data integration right. better Dave, across Dave, the we enterprises? We've got a couple minutes left. I know you got one question. I got one, one okay, final okay. question. Um, looking forward, I mean, you have a lot of history with Sun, you're at a cutting edge company with Greenplum, you're now with EMC, the leader in, in uh, storage virtualization, number one, as Dave wrote about. Um, what's the future look like? Give us a, your view, I mean, given what you know, and your experience, and kind of what cloud enables. How big is it going to be, and what, what are some of the things that you might see? And not even related to, to the data business or your business, uh, it could be, but what are the things will the world be seeing? I mean, Apple has a big announcement going on today. Right. Apple's the, the epitome of edge robustness, right. know, the user experience, right. and the expected user experience now. So talk about, from your personal perspective, what you see unfolding. Yeah, I think what's going to happen is, is uh, you know, so we think data will become core, right, to how applications get delivered, et cetera, both in your, in your business life and in your personal life. And I think our, our job is to provide access to those data, an engine that allows you to scale and provide those services in meaningful ways that we, we just can't envision today. If you think about all the things that are coming at people about who you are and what you're trying, how you're interacting with yeah. these systems, I think just being that enabler right, from a technology perspective is going to be a huge trend. And I think it's fundamentally going to shift the way people think about uh, their interaction with infrastructure. I think Paul talked about it the right way, right? That the, the fundamental shift that's going on around virtualized infrastructure is going to be critical and touch every aspect of our life. I, I think the other point that, that maybe is a, a, a little less visible, is it's not only about moving infrastructure closer to data, if you will. It's also about connecting people to this new world, right? So how do people collaborate? People-centric model. People-centric model, totally, around who are the rock stars inside enterprises getting insights into their business, and how do they share that with the executives of the organization, or how do I share that into my personal life, et cetera. Now, obviously, to your earlier question, security, authentication, those things really There's matter. There's some minimums that need to be achieved. They have to be like there. Table right? stakes. But that yeah. speaks to why you have to have this common infrastructure, yeah. like VMware is talking about. That speaks to the whole VMware proposition. Exactly, exactly. So you can think of us as really the killer app on top of that infrastructure, connecting data across the Data warehouse has always been this like weird like back room operation, exactly. like what's going on back there, slow, you know, archiving. And, and that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about bringing data to the forefront. To the, to Which the is masses, what businesses want. Right? Yeah, that's I mean, the agility exactly. message too. It's People the agility don't message. And, 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 but it's also, you know, as I mentioned, the power user to the executives, to the consumers, right? Making that work in a very seamless way. And this, this speaks to why I think EMC, you know, to give my, my boss a little credit here, to Pat and, and Joe, I think had the foresight to see where this was headed. And, uh, and thought Greenplum was the right asset to put well, inside of EMC. Well, we want to congratulate you on the acquisition, your team, um, well done. You guys have been working hard. Now, of course, you've got more work to do. You've got to start hiring people and, and, and ramping up. So uh, good luck with that. Thank you. Bill Cook, CEO of Greenplum. We've got uh, Sanjay Mershandani, CIO of EMC, coming up next. And, He's uh, my customer now. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay, we'll be right back. Okay, thanks, guys. Hey, Bill. Great job. Thanks. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Thanks. This is theCUBE, live from the Moscone Center in San Francisco. This is SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld 2010. Now, inside theCUBE. Hi, we're back live. This is Dave Vellante, CubeCasting from the Moscone Center, VMworld. I'm here with Sanjay Merchandani. Great to have Thanks. you on, Sanjay. Good to be here. Silicon Angle's continuous coverage here of VMworld. So we've got the CIO segment coming up. CIO of EMC, a little company uh, in New England. <laughs> and then uh, next we have Brian Bosserman, CIO of Foster Pepper, one, one of your customers. So um, let's get right to it. Um, talk about EMC's uh, journey to the private cloud. You guys have been out marketing this concept. You know, our audience wants to know, are you guys eating your own dog food? Are you able to to absorb these technologies? Why don't you talk a little bit about what sure, you guys are doing? Sure, sure. Um, well, first of all, great to be here. 
Thank you. Um, journey to the private cloud. I mean, that's that's something that's evolved over the last couple of years, um, and you know, a couple of things in that that we should pay attention to. It is a journey, and today we have a better definition around cloud. You know, about what it was when we started this out. It was probably four or five years ago, and it was uh, more in journey and virtualization and information management, and quickly evolved into into private cloud as as the technology and uh, and the industry got shaped the way it is today. We we started this. Um, uh, much as any other customer of ours or any 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 large company like ours would do, which is you know we were we were growing, uh, we were global, uh, we were acquiring companies, and uh, you know keeping up with the pace was a challenge and and classic classic uh, situation where our data centers were almost 100% um, allocated at every given point of time, but not necessarily 100% utilized. So we went down the path of really taking, being very early adopters of, of core VMware technology as well as some of our own storage technologies um, and putting them into, putting them through their paces uh, in production early in the life cycles. And rapidly moved um, beyond dog footing. I think dog footing is, is a term that Paul Moritz gets credit for. Uh, many years ago, uh, and we go beyond dog pooling. We're actually, you know, we're, we're making sure that the product roadmaps fit our roadmaps in IT, and we're working together both pre-GA uh, products as well as once they come out, and use cases that we can take to our customers. So we, it's a program. We call it uh, EMC IT Proven, and uh, in the sense that we test the technology, we work with the technology, talk about it. A little bit ahead of some of the other EMC customers potentially? Yes, and uh, we do that okay. with VMware as well as uh, the, all, the, all the products that EMC produces. Right, get, get nice and close so we can right. hear. Right. So, um, talk a little about, bit about your, your virtualization strategy. I mean, how far have you been able to push it and, and what are the barriers to pushing it further? Well, when you have um, Joe Tucci and, uh, and Paul Moritz doing your review, so to speak, um, the goal was very simple. You know, we had to run mission critical, uh, a $16 billion enterprise on 100% virtualized infrastructure. So that was the goal given 100%. to me. 100%. Yeah, and so we're about 70% down that path. Mark the, Egan uh, was here. He said, yeah. you know, they're 97% of the way right. there. So. Uh, and, and Mark and I talk frequently, yeah. and um, we're about 70% of the way there on the, store, on the uh, uh, compute side, on the server side. The goal being, um, early part of next year to hit 100% uh, x86, 100% virtualized. That's how what we're working towards. How about the application portfolio? Talk about that. Sure. So roughly 60% of our mission critical applications in, in some significant manner are virtualized. And um, you have to keep moving up that. You have to be relentless about, about driving that. Um, the dashboard we look at looks at server virtualization, looks at storage virtualization, looks at mission critical applications, looks at overall applications, looks at desktops. So we track that very closely. We track that on a monthly basis. And um, you know the goal there, again, is to, to drive to 100%. So actively working on that. How about your Oracle apps included? A uh, large piece of the Oracle, you know, the app side, the web tier, the middleware. Um, yeah, we... Is Safra helping you with that? Or? <laughs> well, we continue working. We're going to be here in a couple weeks at uh, Oracle Open World. I'm sure you so will be. Uh, <laughs> we'll ask her. Um, and how about VDI? You, uh, do we need anything in the desktop? Yes, we are. So VDI is, you know, um, Windows 7 and, and, and upgrading the user experience on the core Windows side. Um, we're looking at virtual desktops as being a key way to deliver that, you know, the whole VDI technology elements. And we have some great announcements yesterday that we're, look, we're obviously looking at working with. Um, the goal is to have about 5,000 users um, in the next couple of months on, on virtual desktops. Uh, and a good mix. So we've got about eight use cases that we look at on um, on VDI, and we're going across them, sort of, so we're striping right across the use cases to make sure this is uh, this is something we want to roll out, and then uh, actively go, you know, um, full force next year. So, you know, I, I appreciate you sharing with the audience some of your internal infrastructure. As as a CIO, though, you know, it's really not just about the technology; it's about so much more. So I want to talk about that. Um, I'd like you to touch upon just your organization, the people side of it. And then I also want to talk about IT as a transformative tool right. uh, and concept. So maybe start with the, the people and, and that side of the equation. It's a great, it's a, you know, it's an absolutely great topic. I mean, at EMC World, I had the, um, uh, you know, the opportunity to share with the audience of what we were doing with the private cloud, what we were doing with our journey. And a big piece of what we did was um, I shared the stage with um, our vice president of infrastructure, IT infrastructure, who's now whose title is now vice president of private cloud, <laughs> IT private cloud, and not just by title, it's by function. And the two of us, John, John and I, share a lot of. Um, we have a lot of passion around the topic because, as much as we work for a technology company, the bits move faster than our abilities to digest them. Mm. And we have to make sure that our our best and brightest are working with this technology in a way that really makes them productive, and 
no one gets left behind because it is moving at an incredible pace. Said a different way, it's an incredible opportunity for IT professionals. One that, you know, having been in this industry for over 20 years, I'd say that this is one that really allows us to not only go deeper with, with our technology, but go wider as well. So if you're business facing in IT, you have a classic IT role where you're, you're, you're interfacing into the business, your customers, You've got to now start thinking catalogs. You've got to start thinking capabilities. You've got to start thinking, you know, price models that are different. Um, if you're delivering, if you're managing storage and provisioning storage, you may do it for two sets of two stacks today, three stacks, four stacks. Tomorrow you're going wide across the enterprise. You're provisioning for the enterprise. Um, so the opportunities for us to grow both this way and deep are, are incredible. You got a V block. The, the, the joke around the, you know, the, IT, uh, the IT shop we, we run is who gets to it first? Is it our systems person? Yeah. Is it our storage person? Is it our network person? Is it our security person? Who gets to it first? So we're, you know, we're going across and deeper. So I think it's an incredible opportunity. Um, we could talk for hours about process you know, and how that evolves. You know, classic ways of, um, of, of uh, triaging a problem when it occurs is, is get everyone that's, uh, that, that touches that application, that touches that situation into a room. You've got a conference call going at a bridge. You, nobody you know, leaves until it's nobody fixed. Nobody leaves until it's fixed. Well, you know what? The cloud changes that significantly. And, um, you know, and so if someone's having an issue with performance in, I don't know, pick up, you know, in Indonesia. Well, you know, you can't get everybody on a call to start figuring that out. You gotta, there's got to be much better ways to manage it, roles, cross skills, tools. It's, it's, uh, it's a, it, I think it's exciting. Yeah. So. Um, you've seen a lot of changes in this industry. Now, let's see, if we go back to the you know, post-dot-com crash, you know, 2001, 2002 timeframe, Nicholas Carr wrote the book, Does IT Matter? And I know at the time I was running a CIO practice and all of our CEOs were like, you know, what does this mean? You know, <laughs> what, do you, what do you guys think? Help us communicate that this is not true, this is insanity. But we've gone through a decade of you know, serious, serious cost cutting. Interestingly, meanwhile, you've had companies like Google and all these cloud players, they've used IT to really debunk you know, uh, Carr's theory, which was actually quite interesting and well-written, but they are IT companies. You know, Google has proven that you can gain competitive advantage through IT. And it seems like traditional IT or corporate IT is really now starting to see that. They're essentially, if, if I could say this, competing with, in a way, those cloud service providers or you know the, the web 2.0 companies do you benchmark yourselves against them or should you be doing that? we definitely should it's a, it's a journey so you know it's on our we do in some cases and others we're going to we, we're building that into our dashboard but absolutely have to be best of class um, we classic IT organizations have to stop thinking themselves as as uh, sole providers you know, the question we, we ask internally of our people is, if our internal customers had a choice, would they come back to us? And would they come back to us happily, right? So not only is the, is the total customer experience important, but the efficiency with which you deliver that, that experience uh, is also very important. So we absolutely want um, the seductiveness of what public cloud services or Uber cloud services provide, but we want that inside, uh, you know, inside our shop. And, um, and so the evolution of a classic data center into a virtualized data center into a private cloud um, we actually want the best practices of that. So that is uh, that is the high watermark, and we're, you know, we're striving to get that. A lot of uh, being a, a CIO, a lot of it is being a, a leader as well. A, sort of a personal question is, what do you see as your qualities of leadership that, that you emphasize, and what are those that you try to balance with others, maybe skills you don't have? What, you know, can you share that with our audience? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. The One of the things that um, coming into this role that was, that, was, uh, that was different was I wasn't the classic IT, I didn't come up the IT ranks, I came from the business, but I'd been around CIOs for a long time, selling into them, working with them, you know, being in services. And what's important, I think, you know, what I learned very quickly um, early in my tenure as CIO was IT professionals don't get paid to take risks. We get paid to make sure that, that the business runs, it's safe, um, you know, it's predictable, and, and that's what we do. But being IT for an IT company, we have to be a showcase for our customers on, on what we do and how we build technology and how we run the shop. So we've, through our um, IT Proven program, gone out and said our, our value within, within the business is helping, the, helping our, our, our company build better products by being a user and giving feedback and helping our external customers use our products better through our experiences. So, take, so we, have, we, you know, we have to do both of those things 
um, and infuse a little risk, calculated risk into the environment to be able to do that. So, so that's sort of, I don't know if that's leadership or not, but that's what we're, we're driving towards. Well, it is, and it's a, it's a big challenge you have. I mean, it's, I, I, mean I think you're right. The, the so companies before you sort of started that whole eat your own dog food. I remember mean, Sun Microsystems went through a major transition from you know, IBM mainframe to, to Sun Systems, and there were real glitches there. It was very high profile. And, sure. And um, so you've got to manage those through your people, your sure. process, and obviously your technology. Um, last question from me, Sanjay, is talk about what advice you would give to your peers who want to take this journey. What do they need to be thinking about? Well, you know, I'd say, um, firstly, it is a journey. So, you know, you've got to pace yourself and you've got to set yourself realistic goals. Um, so, you know, think of it as a, as the, you know, I, I think of the private clouds as a state we want to achieve, not necessarily a skew I want to buy. Mm -hmm. But every skew I buy should help me get to that state that I want to achieve, okay. right? Okay. Um, what we also see is that you'll hit 25, 30, 35, 40 percent virtualization and you go, well, that's pretty good. I got all these savings. I'm done. You've only just begun. So be relentless about making sure that you don't put physical back into this journey into the private cloud. You've got to stay virtual. So um, we are absolutely ruthless about any technology that we put into, our, in, into the enterprise that, um, that doesn't fit the bill towards the private, if you were towards the, pr the private cloud. The other thing we say all the time to ourselves, another way of saying that is no U-turns. So we're going virtual, we're going virtual all the way and no you're all in that. and you're all in so um, and you know so so far so good and you know I'd say um, it, it, almost cliched but I'd say this especially if you know you're not from an IT organization and the cloud isn't as obvious as it may be you know in the business we're in is um, you really need to be able to communicate or get executive support on what you're trying to do um, it is more efficient it is um, you know it is more agile but it isn't it isn't always obvious and so, you know, you've got to be able to make sure that you've got the top-down understanding on this as a CIO uh, as you move through this journey, because there will be a little pushback as you go through it. That's great advice. So, you know, I'd say, I'd share that. It sounds a little cliche, but I'd say yeah, it's, 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 it's important. Sorry. All right, we're here with Sanjay Mirchandani, SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage live at theCUBE. Sanjay, thanks very much thanks, for Dave. sharing your perspectives. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, up next is Brian Bosserman, CIO of Foster Pepper. Should we bring him right in? All right, let's, let's go right to it. CIO chair. Yeah, the CIO hot seat today. All right, so we're here at the Moscone Center. Another great day, day three. Kristen Nicole here with SiliconAngle.tv. We were sitting at the Cube at VMworld 2010 and noticed a bunch of stuff going on right outside. News stations are lining the streets. Thanks to Steve Jobs' announcement today with Apple, we've got a new Apple TV coming out today. It's the size of your hand, and it comes with all kinds of new features. It's got Netflix streaming and um, YouTube support, Flickr, mobile me access, and all sorts of other sharing features that you've pretty much always wanted with your Apple TV. We have Ethernet, HDMI outputs, Wi-Fi support, and all kinds of other fun features that you'll hear about later on. Another announcement from Apple was the new iTunes 10 coming out. It includes a new social feature called Ping. Looks a lot like Facebook. You'll be able to share things like comments and your music preferences. It's got social music discovery incorporated into its features and you'll also be able to see things like concert listings near you. Other than the new iPod redesigns, one of which includes the iPod Touch that has FaceTime features in it. That's about all the news we have on the streets. Back to you with theCUBE, John. West, we have offices in Seattle and Spokane, about 120 attorneys, and uh, we have a broad range of practice groups that uh, service lots of great clients. Okay, so, um, so what are you doing here? What's, uh, what's your uh, virtualization affinity? Well, this is my third VM world, so I'm an alumni. And Officially now, right? Yes, it exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, uh, just here to get the latest, greatest on the VMware uh, technologies that are coming out, figuring out how to further take advantage of those offerings in our data centers. And um, we have been very successful so far. We're about 95% uh, virtualized. So I just wanted to take a look at the new stuff and 
talk to some of the people in the industry that uh, have helped me along the way, and that's kind of why I'm here. So talk a little bit about life at your organization prior to virtualization. What was it like, and take us through sort of the transformation. Sure, so um, I guess about uh, two years ago, we had about 60 physical servers in our Seattle data center, and um, we uh, were getting kind of full, kind of uh, maxing out our power and our AC and our rack space and all that kind of stuff, and we decided to take a look at uh, VMware, and we'd done a little bit of work with it up at that point, but we really decided to kind of go full tilt, and uh, that was in the 3.02 days. Um, so we got about 25% uh, virtualized about a year ago. Uh, we got upgraded to 3.5 and then 4.0, and we're on 4.0 update 2 now, and uh, we run on 6 physical servers, 110 ser Windows servers. So uh, we've reduced the amount of physical servers, you know, tenfold, and we've doubled the number of virtual, uh, virtual servers. So it's been uh, a great journey for us, yeah. Now how about the apps? What, what, you, did you start like everybody with test and dev and then sort of roll it we, out? We or? did, um, test and dev, then we kind of went uh, to our lower utilization servers, kind of our domain controllers, print servers, you know, kind of the low hanging the fruit. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but now we have Exchange 2003, we just implemented Exchange 2010, we have our SQL servers, I mean we have everything running um, our line of business app, so it's I thought been. you weren't supposed to do that. A, yeah, Microsoft <laughs> the other day, they were saying, you know, they didn't say this, I'm tongue in cheek, but I mean, Microsoft's generally been saying, you know, use DAS on 2010. I say Microsoft has its head up its DAS. And, um, <laughs> but it works pretty well, 2010, SQL, virtualized. It, we had some other customers telling us similar stories, and we yeah. love it. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, Exchange 2010 is actually certified on VMware. So it depends on who you talk to at Microsoft, but at least part of their uh, company is embracing the VMware technology as well, even though they compete, well, ag the, compete against it at the I same mean, I time. Yeah. Personally, I think the Exchange group is looking at you know Google and Google Apps and Gmail saying, wow, we need to sure. lower the cost wherever possible, at least the perceived cost. And, but I think, as you know, at scale, um, the cost of a shared infrastructure is going to be lower. Right, and just, you know, the, the other thing is agility, right? I mean, in, in our environment, um, and everybody's environment, you, you want to be supporting the business, and you want to be able to react to the needs of the business, and the VMware infrastructure lets you do that. So, if a new technology comes up that we want to uh, invest in, um, for instance, uh, SharePoint 2010, um, there's some technologies there that are very valuable for our law firm, uh, which we do a lot of documents, as you might imagine. Right. Um, and we needed to build a bunch of servers real quick. So I built five SharePoint 2010 servers in one day and put all the specs in, got them all patched up, and you know all that kind of stuff. You know, in the physical world, you just can't do that. When you consolidated all those servers, you know, it's 10x consolidation, um, I, I presume that they, they were underutilized at the, at the starting point. Um, one, one of the things we hear from a lot of the clients in the Wikibon community is when they do that consolidation, one of the few applications that wasn't you know, underutilizing servers was backup. So did you have to change your backup strategy? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I'm not sure if we had to change our backup strategy, but, but, we, but we chose to, and the reason why is we use uh, EMC um, as our storage area network and we're currently using the uh, EMC NS480 in Seattle and Spokane, and so we replicate all of our data between Seattle and Spokane, so we have a full copy of all of our servers um, in Spokane, so that's uh, great to be able to do that, but in addition to that, we use snapshotting technology uh, through a product from EMC called Replication Manager, and what that does is gives us a local copy of all of our servers as well, so um, in the event we need to restore something, we don't have to go to tape, we don't have to go to archival disk. The copy that we need is already in our SAN and ready to go and ready to be restored. I just have to mount it and I can mount and restore the whole server or just one file, however I want to so do no, it. You don't, you don't use any tape? No, no tape at all? We don't use any tape. So it's all disk to disk? It's all do disk to disk. Any, you know, do you use any deduplication technology? We do use uh, data domain uh -huh. uh, for our deduplication, and uh, we do uh, 
replicate that also to Spokane. Um, so that's kind of a transition. We haven't fully transitioned to the new model of snapping and replication uh, using the EMC SAN. We're just you know, going through that process still. Um, so we still have our old process, which is uh, copying to the data domain uh, storage and then replicating that. So we have both ways of doing it right now. So last question for me is, mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to your peers that want to take a similar journey? What should they focus on? Well, I, I would just say, you know, get started because um, there's lots of reasons not to go down a new technology path. But, uh, you know, what we have found is we have a lot more flexibility um, in this new environment and we can respond to the business uh, much quicker. So initially we were just kind of doing it as a cost savings project, um, but now it really gives us that agility and, and the ability to um, go into new technologies and it's so much easier to manage. We've gone from, you know, three engineers managing our infrastructure to one. And it's, uh, those other engineers now can focus more on application and delivering to the business instead of working on you know, network hardware and server hardware and that kind of thing. That's a big theme that we're hearing uh, here from Brian Bosserman and other CIOs is moving beyond cost cutting into business enablement. Business enablement, Brian Bosserman, CIO of Foster Pepper, thanks very much for being on theCUBE. Thank you. Right. Stay live. Stay live. Okay, we're going to stay live here and um, let's see, is, uh, is Kent here? Is no, we're going to go to the news package. Oh, great. Okay. And then Stu. Okay, Dave. <laughs> so, Dave, we uh, having a good morning. Yeah, uh, CEO from Green Plum, bought by EMC. We couldn't get him to tell us how much he paid. They got paid. He's a tough. He's a tough character. He's good. Um, so, uh, we're at live at the Moscone Center. Exclusive coverage on SiliconAngle.tv, VMworld Live 2010 in the Cube. And we're downtown San Francisco at the Moscone Center, and uh, there's a lot of action going on. So um, here at VMworld, but you know, the world just changed a little bit today because Apple announced some new products. So we sent out Kristen Nicole, our news editor, with uh, a video camera. Mark Hopkins went out there with her, and uh, she's out there on the scene. And we're going to go to her, Michael. When we she available? Is she ready? Okay, we're going to go to Kristen Nicole, who's on the scene to talk about the Apple Kristen announcement. Nicole here with so, uh, Kristen, TV. what's going on down we there? We were sitting at the Cube at VMworld 2010 and noticed a bunch of stuff going on right outside. News stations are lining the streets. Thanks to Steve Jobs' announcement today with Apple, we've got a new Apple TV coming out today. It's the size of your hand, and it comes with all kinds of new features. It's got Netflix streaming and um, YouTube support. Flickr, mobile me access, and all sorts of other sharing features that you've pretty much always wanted with your Apple TV. We have Ethernet, HDMI outputs, Wi-Fi support, and all kinds of other fun features that you'll hear about later on. Another announcement from Apple was the new iTunes 10 coming out. It includes a new social feature called Ping. Looks a lot like Facebook. You'll be able to share things like comments and your music preferences. It's got social music discovery incorporated into its features and you'll also be able to see things like concert listings near you. Other than the new iPod redesigns, one of which includes the iPod Touch that has FaceTime features in it. That's about all the news we have on the streets. Back to you with the Cube, John. It was uh, great. Apple, they got a big billboard across the street. We can see it, and the Apple store is packed with trucks. CNBC, CNN, Dave, you know, they got the big trucks, and we've got the Cube here. Um, We're humble, social, but. Social know. media broadcast <laughs> going on here live at VMworld. Wall to wall coverage, blanket coverage here live. Uh, three full days, you know, 8 to 5.30 every day. We've gone in depth with CEOs. But let's talk about Apple. I mean, let's just riff on the Apple thing. I mean, Apple is the epitome of the edge. I mean, the user experience that, that Apple has innovated on has been game changing. Everyone's following suit. Google putting a ton into Android, trying to catch up. They're going open, Apple's going to stay closed. But, you know, Apple is just really killing it. Doing a great job, just pumping out great products. And the user demand for that kind of user interface is driving a lot of the force behind, you know, VDI and virtualization of the desktop. And it makes, it makes IT guys look like, you know, amateurs. I mean, the old PC model is not working. Bring your PC to work, all this stuff. It's just well, crazy. You're right, I mean, the innovation is tremendous. One of the things I've seen, it's certainly a theme of this show, is I think the IT people are waking up to that very quickly because they're getting such demand from, from users. 
And they're saying, we've got to accommodate this. I mean, even VMware itself sort of changing the whole discussion from desktop you know, to end user computing. I mean, that's a clear trend and they don't want to miss it. Yeah, and Jeremy Burton from uh, CMO of EMC was on here. He was talking about the consumerization of IT, and Apple really is a great example of the consumerization. And the question, you know, for you for you to talk about is, what do you think that's going to be in the IT environment? Will that ever be? Will the IT departments ever be Apple-like, well, enabling think that, that kind of really great user experience? Well, I think that innovation is totally flipped in this industry, right? It used to be that all the innovation was coming out of the big, big data centers, and and now that's clearly not the case. You know, it's the the user's laptops, it's the user's desktops, it's the user's devices that are driving things, that um, really driving back into the data center. So my feeling is that eventually the data center is adopting these technologies, but the consumer is now the center of innovation. It seems like the, the conversation we're hearing from everyone we talk to is the old ways stuck. The network model, the compute model is stuck and there's a new, new network that's emerging and it's flat. La you know, layer two, as Doug Gourlay said, for the geeks, but really flat, enabling the kind of Apple-like experience. I mean, you're talking about, you know, what they're doing here with Facebook. I mean, they're integrating Facebook into iTunes. Yeah. I mean, that's just about time. They got this new ping service. So, you know, Apple's just leading the way. And, and new and apps. I mean, right? It's Android, all about this new breed Android's of apps. trying to catch up. Google. John, you should do a Cube app. What do you think? Is that, uh, <laughs> Get some developers to do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any cash. Hello, sponsors. Um, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we need money. So, um, but uh, you know, we we'll do the apps. We're going to have social networks. We're going to have, you know, transporter rooms. You know, you name it, we'll have it. Um, seriously, what do you think about Android, though? I mean, Android is, um, is really getting the numbers up in terms of deployment. Apple's taking that, you know, monolithic, you know, closed. I mean, the whole. I mean, I've written about this, and, and Android just surpassed. Uh, 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 iPhone is number two. It's the number two platform according to Gartner, right? And so. My feeling is that Android, that open ecosystem, is ultimately going to be uh, a winner, and it's unclear what Oracle's move recently. Well, we're going to have Rod Johnson, the CEO of Spring, now at VMware, on at two o'clock. So, yeah, great. you know, that to me is a real, uh, real key point in the VMware architecture around spawning some innovation around developers, because you know, Android is just a totally robust platform for developers to get distribution. If you, you're developing an app, you're going to need to have a platform. You got Android, and you got these new cloud technologies out there. So to me, I'm going to watch that pretty closely, and we're going to track it on cloudangle.com. That's a great new publication you guys launched, so congratulations on that. All right, we have to wrap here at theCUBE. We'll be back uh, this afternoon. We've got a great lineup. Well, speaking uh, of new networks, we're going to have uh, uh, a guy from Juniper Networks come in, and they have a new architecture, so we're going to talk to him about that, what that enables. Yeah, we'd love to learn more about those new networks, and how things are flat and what it means for cloud service providers in particular. So. Okay, great. We'll be right back. Continuous coverage, SiliconANGLE. Stu's coming up next, Stu Miniman and uh, Juniper Networks. So we'll be right back. Exclusive coverage, SiliconANGLE.com, SiliconANGLE.TV, here at theCUBE, on the ground at Moscone, live in San Francisco for VMworld 2010. We'll be right back. For all the actions happening, we just uh, ran a news report. Uh, Kristen Nicole out in the streets getting the uh, scoop on the big Apple announcement, and what better way to transition from the Apple news, which really is about user experience, but something's got to power all that, all that action. So we have uh, Abner from Juniper Networks and Stu Miniman from the Wikibon Project, senior analyst, uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Thanks. So, so Abner, we were just talking about uh, the Apple news, and obviously Apple's a big epitome of the user experience out there at mobile, and mobile is, you know, everyone expects mobile. User experience has changed and the demand is unprecedented in terms of this disruption. They want everything at the edge, they want it fast, uh, they want it secure. Um, your company, Juniper Networks, competes with Cisco Systems and so, you know, you guys are the guys running the networks, okay? You have the plumbing, running the bits and the packets, work with the carriers, running the, uh, the data across the network. What's changing? You guys have a philosophy that's quite different than Cisco. Um, Cisco's the, you know, fully integrated stack. Um, pushing some video as well, so they're, they're pushing an innovation message, but you guys have a new architecture. So compare what you guys are doing with Cisco, and Stu, let's riff on the whole, what is the preferred network architecture for the user experiences? Sure. And, and I think what we really want to hear here is you know, how virtualization changes networks and, and what that means for the environment. All right, two big questions, actually fairly closely related. So, Classically, networking was a black box that I bought into, and a particular vendor would develop the silicon, the, all the software for it. 
uh, and I, I bought a box. And so today you hear network people talk about, oh, I've got a Juniper over there, I've got a Cisco over there, and, and they refer to their boxes as uh, the way that they build networks. What's happened is that in the networking world, Juniper in particular has looked at, well, what's the architecture that the rest of the IT industry has adopted? And that's an, an architecture that's a layer cake model where the applications are separate from the operating system, which is separate from the silicon, and that allows you to innovate very quickly and do some interesting things like start to solve management problems because no longer do you want to manage just one box, you want to manage all the boxes in concert with each other and you don't want to think of them as boxes anymore, you want to think of them as, as a network. Which brings us to virtualization. So one of the things that's happened with virtualization is the you have a set of virtual connections that applications connect to, and then you have an underlying infrastructure that's physical. Right. And if your underlying infrastructure is spaghetti, you can't connect those things together. It's, it's, you're just sort of layering some, some sauce on that, and it, it might work for a little while, but it doesn't necessarily get you the, uh, the ability to move things around very, in a very fluid fashion. And so one of the things that we look at is, well, one, how do you innovate on the network in a way that's identical to the classic IT innovation model, which is open it up, give you uh, an open interface for people to develop new applications, uh, have a common interface across multiple components of the network. So Juniper runs Junos, which is our operating system across switching, routing, and security, and that allows us to do some really cool th things with partners and, um, and help drive down the cost of building the reliable network that companies have always wanted, but has been very difficult to achieve with uh, legacy architectures. Stu, you're an expert in this area, obviously you're an, and you're an analyst, you're covering this new architecture models that are emerging from the vendors and the companies innovating out there. What's your angle on, and you worked at EMC, so you know the storage business up and down, but you also know networking. What's your angle on, on what's happening from your research and what you're seeing out in the marketplace? Uh -huh. Talk about. You know, what, what that is. Oh, okay, John, so, uh, you know, w w before it used to be network was just kind of the pipes that got me things, and the, the separation, there wasn't a real strong connection between my application and what I needed to do. It was just the network guy was over there, go provision me some bandwidth, uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, if you got to go play with quality of service, that was usually a dirty word uh, to the networking guys, a and today, you know, it's not set it up once, and forget about it, and you know it grows and expands and moves incrementally, but now we have a completely different scenario where what you put today is going to move all the time, it's changing all, all over the place, and the, the, the biggest challenge here is really from a management perspective. Security is also a real big issue, but uh, what I've seen Juniper doing is the integration that they've done with VMware, and I think they're talking about that here at the conference, is uh, have some, some great solutions pulling together you know, the virtual infrastructure and management. Right. So, so the question I have for Abner, maybe Stu as well, is that we heard about server consolidation around with Fusion IO and all this stuff where they're consolidating but yet increasing performance. So the question is, is it the same on the network side where there's some consolidation or reconfiguration and higher performance? Is that the same kind of direction? Do you see that going that way or what's, you know, Abner, what's going yeah, on so at, the, at, the, at the lower levels there? Yeah, you, you don't have consolidation from in the same way that we consolidated servers, or for the same reason we had server, we consolidated servers. We consolidated servers because there was um, an, an efficiency problem. We were, it just wasn't getting utilized. The consolidation that's occurring on the network is we have a, a new design problem. So in, when we move from client-server architectures, the design problem was how do I get the traffic from the server out into the rest of the world. Now it's how do I pull it into the data center, bounce it around a whole bunch of times, and then spit it back out. So, so, so Abner, actually, if, I, if you don't mind me yeah. jumping in here. So actually, I think there, first of all, there is an efficiency issue right. with networking today. Uh, Juniper and a lot of your competitors out there are solving that because rather than having you know, uh, you know, blocking architectures, right. over-provisioning, we're, we're now building you know, much bigger scale-out architectures that are going to be able to support cloud-type uh, applications, and we're using every port, and we're going to much you know, higher speeds. We've got 10 gig now, 40 gig and 100 gig just been approved, and are coming soon, so the price per port is, is such that it needs to be used, right. and, and we can't just waste resources the way, waste maybe is the wrong word, but we have to more efficiently use uh, right. everything it, that we have. So. The, the efficiency problem is 
one of basically asking a very simple question. How do you get traffic from one side of a data center to the other? And whether that traffic is application traffic, because our application architectures have changed, whether it's a VM that's moving across the data center because our compute architectures have changed, or whether it's moving storage across the data center because our storage architectures are changing, um, that requires a, a fundamentally different architecture that, make, that you, where you need to be as efficient as possible in a, a number of different places. It's not just moving the packets, it's management and, um, and just what's, how do you operate the network and automate all of those different moving parts. Right, and, and, and I think you know, really networking bears the brunt of a lot of the changes that are going on in virtualization. Before, um, you would have a steady growth and, and a really predictable pattern of traffic, and now we're moving things all over, um, you know, spikes, and there, there aren't, there's not the downtime to reconfigure, so. Well, I'd like to chip into the virtualization, yeah. but let, let's hold that for a second, because okay. I think Abner brings up a good point. Change is happening, the fact, the, 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 the constant thing that we're seeing is change. Randy Bias on earlier, an entrepreneur uh, who's building clouds from scratch. You know, it's this disruptive change we haven't seen in 30 years, and it's going to continue to disrupt for 20 more years, as his, his quote, which is great. Uh, the question is, is that we have a philosophy difference. I mean, Juniper in particular, you talk about Juno, so it's a kind of an open. So here in the VMware world, you got open models where there's innovation extraction from ecosystems. Todd Nielsen saying for every dollar is $15 of ecosystem money, which basically means people get make money and go public and things happen. Um, and you got guys like Oracle, right? So we heard that at SAP. Oracle, SAP, open, VMware, closed. People want to know, really, Juniper and Cisco, it seems to be the same argument, like Cisco, Oracle, Juniper. Talk about you guys, how you differentiate, how you position so, via Cisco. So, so can I just, to add to that point, I guess, so uh, VMware laid out a new vision today uh, for where they're going with networking. So VMware, they're calling it their V chassis vision. So this is taking uh, the virtual switch, uh, they had the virtual distributed switch, and now they really have a virtual director. So Abner and I were talking earlier because um, I've talked to a lot of the networking players out there, and there's that, uh, there, there's let's say some friction between VMware's vision and where some of the infrastructure uh, players are going. So I'm curious to get you know your your, your take on this. Yeah, well, we don't have a, a big legacy infrastructure in the data center to protect. So the more dis the faster disruption occurs, right. um, that's okay with us. And the the piece that's that, that all of this comes down to is what are the components that an IT manager can move around. So today, a VM is sort of the, as somebody said, the atomic unit of cloud computing. Yeah. And if I've standardized my VMs, I can move them within my own infrastructure and out into other infrastructures. I think there's an open question in terms of how does that, do those atomic units and what are the different slices that, uh, that managers can move around to optimize their own infrastructures, burst into clouds for, um, for that uh, capability and the, the economics around that. And you know, we look at how do you interface with those sorts of systems like the VMware V chassis, and that's where you need a, a web services interface that crosses all of the components of the network, um, and we do that with a, a platform called Juno Space. Right, I mean, let's talk about the virtualization. We got two minutes left, so um, well, if you want to address the Oracle kind of open, close issue, that you can do that real quick. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you know, and, Cisco, the open, and the open Juniper. close, look, everybody's trying to open all sorts of interfaces. And so the issue isn't how many interfaces do you have open and are your interfaces more open than, than the other guys. The issue is can developers develop on your platform in a way that at some point you don't pull the sand out from yeah, underneath yeah. them, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's, they, they can't develop on sand, they've got to develop on concrete. Stu, so on the virtualization piece, what are you seeing in terms of virtualization? Because virtual machines can be used for configurations, help balance networks. Doug Gourlay from Arista Networks earlier mentioned, you know, load balancing is going to be a kind of a big area. We heard Fusion IO with the storage side. It's, what's going on in the networking? What does virtualization enable? Right, so, so I, if you, you know, comment, that'd be great. Right. Yeah. I mean, virtualization, if you look, the, you know, we had a bunch of years that virtualization was a pure economics play where it was doing consolidation. Now we have uh, many operational uh, pieces of virtualization that are making changes. Um, but, you know, on, on the economic conditions, uh, you know, hopefully we're 
doing a little bit better uh, globally and, and therefore that it's giving us some opportunities for hopefully take advantage of some more innovations uh, out there in the marketplace. Yeah, I would say, you know, virtualization, when, you're, when you start moving VMs around, it loads the network, which is great. Uh, it creates a, a series of security problems and, and we have some, some nice solutions with uh, a couple of partners. Uh, we also think that, you know, you need to get the network out of the way to a certain degree because the network's not the, the important part, as, as you know, pays my paycheck, but um, the network is secondary to the application. And when you look at how do you spin applications up very, very quickly, uh, the infrastructure can't be in the way of that. And that's, that's where people are trying to make sure that it's not. Um, you know, one, one way that people are getting in, in the way of each other today with virtualization is what does the network guy manage on the physical network and what does the server guy manage on the virtual network? And is it a interface problem or is it an orchestration yeah. problem? We believe it's an orchestration problem. Yeah, well we have one minute left, or just under one minute, so real quick, just, just predictions, I mean, in the, in the networking business. What's going to change? What's going to be the disruptive enabler? Just real quick, kind of summarize that real fast. Um, it's what is the software architecture and how does that software architecture drive costs down for customers in both CapEx and OpEx? Stu? What's your vision the next couple of years with networking? Right, so, so uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a great time to be in the networking space because while we've had a long time that nothing has changed, pretty much everything's changing now. So you know, a switch isn't going to look like a switch anymore. The physical and, and virtual uh, barriers are all coming down. And uh, you, you know, you talk about the Apple and everything, you know, consumerization of IT, uh, you know, that, that's going to hit the network side too. Okay, we're here at SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld Live 2010. We're hearing about the networking side, how all this disruption is going to be changing, even how networks are built and scaled and managed and uh, to support these consumer apps, whether they're IT or mobile consumer. So uh, it's great. Thanks, guys, very much. We'll be right back. We'll take a short break, and uh, we'll be right back this afternoon. Two minutes. discussed here at theCUBE as client-server was. So that whole disruptive client-server, LAN, PCs connected, created huge opportunities. Nobel was a great success story in the, in the 80s and 90s around uh, networking. So mm -hmm. cloud, cloud is a disruptive new opportunity. So what are you guys doing here? What's this all fit in? Tell us about the VMware relationship and you have news announcing like right now. Yeah, we do. Hey, thanks John. Uh, the, um, let me tell you a little bit about Novell first. Sounds like I need to bring you up to date. So Novell is today an infrastructure software company focused on what we call the intelligent workload management market, which is the combination of private and hybrid clouds and the ability to move work where it's best uh, processed. We help customers secure and manage that environment. And uh, we're very excited to be here at VMworld 2010. Uh, today we're announcing the general availability of SLES for VMware, a co-branded Linux distribution that'll be shipping at no extra cost to every vSphere customer starting today. Big and that's a pretty exciting announcement for Novell, very exciting announcement for the industry. It's a, it's a landmark. Uh, um, Talk about your relationship with VMware, okay? You guys had a have a relationship, Not it's not a new thing. So mm -hmm. just give us a little color on uh, your relationship with VMware. Sure, uh, we've had a long-standing relationship as being um, members of the IT industry, helping each other in standards boards and cooperating on, on certifications. But this is, a, this is a landmark agreement, very different. Uh, VMware will be OEMing SLES, sending it out at, through their distribution channels, and VMware will be um, providing support on the SUSE Linux Enterprise distribution through their channel, and they'll be providing a level one and level two support, and Novell will be backing them up. So, so this is uh, a very integrated, uh, agreement that brings their customers um, a lot of value. So they, they laid out the roadmap, and VMware's been buying a lot of companies, and Novell's probably too too expensive to buy, but uh, you're OEMing it. So what does that fit into VMware? What's their interest in this? I mean, they got the new architecture, sure. infrastructure, apps, end user experience stuff with virtualization at the core. So can you drill down on that for us? Sure, if you if you look at the virtualization journey that, that VMware is, um, is leading, they're seeing their customers now want to bring mission critical applications onto their virtual infrastructure, as well as Linux being the fastest growing operating system in market today. And it's really that combination of the customer trends and the customer requests that have brought this agreement together, because they'll now be able to bring 6,000 certified applications 
many of which are mission critical, that are certified today on SUSE Linux to their customer base immediately. So Novell's really transformed itself, a big open source proponent. Uh, to talk a little exactly. bit about how that whole open source movement fits into you know, the, the VMware ecosystem mm -hmm. and how you add value to customers. Sure, um, Novell, as you, as you know, back in uh, 2003, uh, purchased SUSE Linux and that's where our open source journey started and we've been very committed to the open source uh, community and there are many companies that rely on what the community develops in, including um, Microsoft even today and VMware and what this combination brings together is the flexibility and the power of innovation that the community has into the virtualization journey that uh, VMware has been leading. So is there a resource people can go to to find some more information about uh, the announcement that you made? Or where, Sure, where absolutely. We're, we've got a really nice booth right behind VMware's booth. It's booth uh, 930, 931. Uh, this afternoon at 4.30 Pacific time, uh, Ragu Raguram and myself will be giving a uh, super session on the announcement in uh, Moscone 134 North. And you can always go to VMware's website, uh, www.vmware.com slash products slash SLEZ for VMware. Dave, we are, uh, we're excited. We had a compelling press conference this morning, big press conference with Todd Nielsen. Um, so it was really great. Thanks for coming by and, and announcing your, uh, your, your product on, on theCUBE. We really appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks we, for the opportunity, John. Thank you very appreciate much, it. Joe. Thanks, David. It's, uh, it's great to have you. We've got a big, big audience today. I just found out we had, uh, John, we hit up to 140,000 over the last, last two and a half days. Yeah. And a big day today. 140,000 to people watching theCUBE live. We're really appreciative. And uh, got any feedback, send it our way. We're on Twitter. We're watching and listening. Uh, although I'm not, we'll be <laughs> interviewing most of the time. But, uh, uh, thanks for watching, siliconangle.com is the website. New site is cloudangle.com, where we'll be doing extensive coverage, deep coverage, blanket coverage of the cloud growth, the revolution around cloud in a whole new way. There's new people, new topics, new conversations, new analysis, and we'll be covering it, wall to wall. So, thanks for watching, and we'll be, we'll be right back. This is theCUBE, live from the Moscone Center in San Francisco. This is SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld 2010. Now, inside the queue. Live. I'm John Furrier, founder of SiliconANGLE. Here with Dave Vellante, the founder of Wikibon, Great big research here. firm. Dave, thank you, John. We're back. We're here, we're here with Kent Langley of Nscaled, CTO. And founder, right? Yeah, that's right, C2 and, uh, and founder. It's great to have you here. Thanks Thank for coming you guys. on. Thank Ken, you guys very much. The cloud, we're hearing all kinds of disruption, disruption stories around cloud, and it's all a lot of high level messaging. Developers are great, going to be ecosystem boom, people going to be making a lot of money, um, growth opportunities up and down the stack, infrastructure, apps, end user. Mm -hmm. Apple's got the big news today. You know, but there's a lot of little nuances in, in the cloud, and, and a lot of them are, you know, configuration, backup, recovery, I mean, meat and potatoes kind of stuff. I mean, you know, yeah. what, you know, your company, Nscaled, is in that world. So how does this all affect you, and tell us what uh, your angle is on all this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, cloud computing for us is, is at Nscale is very much a way uh, to deliver a service like business continuity and disaster recovery that previously was incredibly difficult, incredibly expensive, and absolutely not capital efficient. Uh, using cloud business delivery models as well as technical delivery models, we're able now uh, to deliver, uh, Inscale's able to deliver disaster recovery and business continuity to our clients uh, at up to 80% uh, less cost than running their own data centers today. Uh, and this and, is live and, you're the and you're the CTO, right? I am the CTO, yes. So technically, what is all the meat and potatoes around some of the things you got to do to make this thing work? Um, what are the core issues? I mean, obviously you got you know, people to choose from to buy products, what's happening? Yeah, absolutely. There, there, are, there are literally dozens of different pieces of technology you have to put together end to end to provide disaster recovery and business continuity. We, we've integrated with partners like Falcon Store uh, using their uh, CDP replication services very effectively. Uh, as well as some of their snapshot technologies to enable things like RPO and RTOs of 15 minutes or less uh, through uh, across the WAN in another data center in another state, literally by clicking a button. Uh, you click activate, your server starts, and your clients can get back to work straight away. That's the most important thing, uh, is making sure that people keep working. So talk a little bit about what you're doing with VMware and you know, how you're deploying it and you know, what it's meant to your business. So our use of VMware is uh, 
global. We have, uh, I believe, approximately 28 distinct geographic locations where we have VMware hypervisors installed in varying concentrations, protecting over 300 and somewhere around three or 400 terabytes of client data today. Uh, VMware for us is, it, it, it's our operating system. I mean, we view it that way very much. Uh, everything that we deploy runs on top of the VMware hypervisor. Uh, from the uh, from the replication technology to the networking technology we're integrated with, and so on and so forth. So it's an enabler for us. So Kent, we were talking earlier about the um, the old the, the remember the managed service uh, provider, the storage service providers in the late '90s, companies like Storage Networks and a number of others, and how it was just I think you said wrong decade. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I then think I mentioned loud cloud. I yeah, said, yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. You also brilliant wrong decade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wrong decade. Right. <laughs> so you, but you, you've also <laughs> wrong said that you've been yeah. waiting to start this company for a while. So talk yeah. a little bit about um, the way in which you've developed this company and, and what's different now, than, and why is this the right decade? And particularly, I'm interested in, in how the whole notion of data protection is changing. Okay. Um, so the way that we've developed this company is, is, is really straightforward. We realize that there are any number of, of, of companies that want to go to cloud. Everybody hears the buzz, everybody knows what it's all about, but using the cloud today, it's really about solving real business problems. And so what we thought we needed to do was provide people a path, a, a gateway, if you will, or a bridge uh, to the cloud. So we've deployed in a, a true hybrid cloud model where we have an on-premise and an off-premise component to our hardware. Uh, the off-premise component are the data centers we manage. On-premise is, think of it as a little slice uh, of our cloud that sits in your data center. And in doing so, what we've allowed people to do is, is, is sort of get rid of the vendor alphabet soup that they have to deal with every day. They, you know, they can sign up with us and pay an on-demand uh, on rate and can only use what they consume uh, or only consume what they need at any given point in time. Right. So, uh, only pay for what they consume. Yeah, right. exactly. Pay for what they consume, use it when you need it, and that's it. And I think that uh, what we've found is the market is incredibly receptive to this. They say things to us like, our, our, our actual live customers say things like, Thank you, this has enabled me to go and do what I want to do, which is provide true value to the business. And I think that that's, as long as I can do that every day, then people are going to keep, you know, keep coming to us. So you mentioned CDP. We actually, uh, on Monday we had Jim McNeil on, who's oh, uh, a CSO of Falcon Store, and, and we were just riffing on you know, backup, how it's changing, virtualization, the impact, and the, the kind of model that we had in our brains was uh, Apple Time Machine for the data center. You know, yeah. where you're essentially you know, doing recovery um, you know, in a very seamless and, and quick fashion, right? You, John, you're, an, you're yeah. a Mac user, you use Time Machine, right? It's just, it, the backup's there, it's, yeah, it's a I mean, fundamental I don't even think about the data, and the, but that's a big story here, is data management, data protection. The number one issue we're hearing from cloud service providers is data protection from their clients. They, won't, they want to go cloud, but they want data protection. Right. So, so is I that mean, where you see this headed? I mean, is it sort of in, in that more dynamic backup and recovery? Is well, well, it is. It's absolutely dynamic. CDP means a lot of things to a lot of people, but for us, it means a very low recovery point objective, say five, ten minutes, uh, and being able to always have the most technically possible available image of not just files, right, but of, of every file, folder, disk, or server that you have and being able to recover that either on-premise or off-premise. It's technology like the Falcon Store CDP devices and the underlying uh, microscan replication that make this possible because it's so efficient. You know, and when I looked at, I looked at dozens of different replication technologies uh, to choose Jim, that Jim one. Jim talked about, Jim, Jim McNeil uh, from Falcon Store talked about how backups change and all this stuff's changing, the definitions are changing. What key things are you seeing around the redefinition when we had Juniper Net was just on about you know changes is, is the constant and what are you seeing specifically around that that's changing? Well, uh, specifically, people don't want to do it anymore. I mean, that to be honest with you, that's the big change. And now backup for, sucks. Yeah, for the, for the <laughs> first time ever, uh, really for the first time, you asked me why is this the right time? The network is there, the servers are there, the virtualization is there, and for the first time ever, people can actually look at their backup services and go, there's a better way. And, and that is about um, being able to do it on demand all the time, out of band, so that you're not impacting your users when you're doing it. Uh, this is crucial, right? Because everybody wants to have 24-7 uptime on everything. And so with these types of technologies, what Enscaled is doing is enabling that and, and also enabling the sort of the global. It's a core business issue yeah. for you, right? Yes. 
So, short, let's talk about, so we've said a few times, shorter RPOs. A lot of people may not know what we're talking about. Many do, I'm sure. But we're essentially talking about how much business you want to, uh, how, much, how much data you want to lose. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Our, our, and our RPOs are getting shorter and shorter and shorter because businesses are saying, I don't want to lose any data. Right. So as little as possible. Well, on, on, on our website, we have specific client case studies uh, of clients that have adopted in scale that have gone from one hour to 24 hour recovery point objectives down to 15 minutes uh, within a 30 day implementation life cycle. So, so, so let's I mean, talk about what that means. So you're talking about if, if something critical or disaster occurred, you're talking about not losing a day's worth of data, but maybe 15 minutes. Maximum. Big, big, big difference. Maximum. And there are the disruption to the business. I mean, that's, that's potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars or more. Absolutely, and you know our our client base is is in the legal industry. They're in the financial services industry. We call them risk intolerant. I like to also call them high value content creators. If you have an, a lawyer making a, a very nice salary uh, for every hour that he works, it's very important that he keep working. You know, because if, if for every minute that he's not, and especially for every minute that email is down, uh, he he's not producing. Uh, in the way that he should. Dave, we got two minutes. So let's, I mean, I wanted to get one, one question in from my standpoint, and then Dave's, we can get one last question in. Um, you guys are in the business, uh, cloud service provider business, and, and a lot of your vendors that support you mm -hmm. have to have the cutting edge technology. Dave and I talked about cloud service providers being a key integral part of this new architecture, but what do they got to do to be successful? What do, you, what, what do you say to the folks that are trying to interface with you and, and, and get you new technology? What are the key things that you need to run your business going forward? Not today, but with virtualization, it's going to enable a whole new set of requirements. What do you demand from the Falcon stores of the world and other vendors? What, what do they got to continue to do or, be, or do differently? You know, I think the biggest change uh, is something that we have to push all our vendors very hard on, and you can call it whatever you like, uh, on-demand business model, SPLA model, SPLA model. Uh, they have to be able to allow us to consume their services in an on-demand model as well. And we've had to fight that a lot over the last couple of years to reach that uh, with all of our vendors. Yeah. Um, that's changing, it's changing very quickly. Additionally, we need rapid, agile development iteration cycles. I can't come to a vendor and say, this doesn't work right. And they'll go, oh, we'll have that fixed six or eight months from now. No, it's got to be two weeks, right? Four weeks, because you've got to match the speed of the market. And no one is going to sit around and wait for you to, to change a piece of code six months from now. No one, you'll move on. Right. So my last question is, Kent, where do you see this? Look, look out in your crystal ball. Where do you see this in, in five years, the whole cloud service provider space, the whole concept of backup and how it's changing? Where, where do you see that going? Wow, that's a big question. It is big. Um, in five years. Yeah, so uh, yeah. Uh, in scaled, you know. Think about uh, your objectives as a company. Where do you want to see it? And how does, you know, the whole vision that we've talked about play in there? Okay, so so for me, five years means that the customer adoption life cycle will have gone full circle multiple times. And that customer adoption life cycle goes from adopting a protection service, replicating it to your local uh, device, getting it into the cloud, and then being able to have the power as a business to make choices like, you know what, I don't want to run that server anymore. I'm going to fail that over, never fail it back. I'm going to leave it there. And that data set will also remain mobile. So if tomorrow I want to take it to a different cloud, or if I want it back for any reason, I'll be able to do that. Today, we're able to achieve those things, but but it's difficult still, even today. It, it's uh, uh, That in five years is going to be like nothing. No one's going to think twice about clicking a button that says, move my stuff to Dallas, move my stuff to, to Hong Kong or anywhere. And I think that's what's really exciting. Really changing the yeah. whole way in which recovery happens. And cloud that's computing. Great. That's a great vision. Yeah, cloud computing is a, a renaissance in the way we do business. It's, it's going to be amazing. So we, we so I, I mentioned this to uh, McNeil when he was on, in the Wikibon community, we're setting forth that, that, that vision of how the industry needs to respond to the, to the changes that virtualization brings, particularly around data protection. So we'd love for you to be part of that, have you back on Wikibon Thank and you. SiliconANGLE. And Thank you very much, you. guys. Great we're to have you on today. We're here live uh, at the Moscone Center and ground floor, and scene of VMworld 2010, live at SiliconANGLE.com's continuous coverage, blanket coverage, wall-to-wall -wall coverage and analysis every day. With more interviews, than, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like the mail, it never stops we have coming. Rich Napolitano, president of ES EMC up next, uh, repeat honcho. guest. He's right. the head honcho for the unified oh. uh, yeah. Security. Most important guy in the company, I always I'm, say. I better <laughs> run the other way. He's a great guy. <laughs> yeah. We'll be right back with Rich <laughs> Napolitano oh, from EMC. Uh, Thanks, Ken.
This is The Cube, live from the Moscone Center in San Francisco. This is SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld 2010. Now, inside The Cube. We're back at theCUBE, siliconangle.com's continuous coverage of VMworld Live 2010 in San Francisco, California at the Moscone South VMworld. 2010 is rocking, we're on the third day, really the second day of big announcements, and I'm always excited uh, because we've done three CUBE events, it's kind of a new product for us, but we've had some consistent guests, Pat Gelsinger from EMC, uh, Rich Napolitano, who's joining us right now, president of Unified Storage at EMC. He's a regular now, so we're yeah. expecting uh, to have you back. Great, great uh, to have you back every as time repeat we do the guests, cube, right? so. Got a lot of people watching. We have up, uh, over 140,000 in the last two and a half days. So yeah. Yeah. So good audience, so uh, yeah. you know, you're a good draw, so keep, yeah. we, got, we need you to come back yeah, in. You guys are super. So uh, tell us, uh, you know, just give us a vibe from your perspective. EMC's been doing a lot of things, obviously with customers here, mm -hmm. you're showing us some technology, obviously the relationship with VMware everyone knows about. But just give some uh, color to the show here in San Francisco, and mm -hmm. we're on the scene, cloud revolutions going mainstream. We're covering it wall to wall here at SiliconANGLE, so give us your angle on that. No, great, and great to be here with you, uh, you guys today, and oh my you know, uh, first of all, I'm looking out here at a beautiful you know, 60 degree day in San Francisco, and there's not a cloud in the sky. <laughs> uh, but uh, here at, here at uh, VMworld, it's a really exciting time. Technology, you know, customers, Six, 17,000 I think it was, uh, total. Huge numbers. Huge numbers, fantastic uh, momentum, you know, uh, on this transition to the virtualized world, to uh, enabling the cloud, just use enthusiasm for this. And it's pretty clear that we're still in the very early days of this massive technology transition. And, uh, you know, uh, there's tons of technology on the floor, a lot of enthusiasm around it, but at the end of the day, what we see here is I think a fundamental shift in our, in our business models and our technology to enable this next wave of uh, you know, data center. And it's really all about taking out cost and complexity and enabling flexibility in the uh, IT infrastructure. Unified storage, give us a definition of that. Because you know, Unified has been kicked around, it's kind of a punchline, Unified sure. Communications, Unified Storage, but it's, you know, Convergence had that same effect, now it's real, mm -hmm. but you know, it kind of has that you know, trajectory of you know, hype build up. Talk about the reality of Unified Storage in context of the cloud real mm -hmm. quick. So, you know, one of the, uh, one of the byproducts of uh, cloud and virtualization is that you're bringing many, many different applications together on a common infrastructure. So really, I think it's all about what, what the applications are doing. So as you bring these many different types of applications onto a common infrastructure, frankly, either physical or virtual, but more and more, you know, 40, 50% of, uh, of server deployments now, I think we saw some data yesterday that half of the server deployments, more than half of the server deployments now are virtualized, which is a, a major tipping point. Uh, but as you consolidate these applications, what you find is that these applications are going to use storage in many different ways. Historically, you know, a database would be a block-oriented infrastructure. So you had the emergence of SANS and other block-oriented infrastructure. Then you had the growth of more and more unstructured file-oriented data, and you saw explosive, a continued explosive growth on the file side. And now you see the emergence of really more programmatic interface, you know, RESTful and SOAP-oriented application interfaces. And so these trends, I think, are really, you know, with the consolidation of the apps, driving to a storage infrastructure that needs to be more diverse and flexible in how it provides service to these applications. So to me, unified means unification, right? You know, look up in a dictionary, right? And so you're bringing unifying these different access methods together on a common infrastructure to really enable the applications. You know, I, I want to talk a little bit about the transformation of your organization. Right? It's, it's pretty diverse, probably the most diverse within EMC, I think that's fair to say. Right? Mm -hmm. A lot of different technologies, a file, block, different software technologies. Um, it's, it's not something that you, you've undertaken overnight. Can you talk a little bit about your portfolio, how you're bringing that together, mm -hmm. and what some of the drivers are? So, um, you know, you have to have a vision and a strategy, and, 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 you know, a vision and a strategy starts from some insight on where things are going, right? And we talked about virtualization and these applications coming together. And so, once you have a vision uh, and a strategy, I think you really need to organize around it. And so, you know, what we've been doing the last couple of years is really bringing these groups that have historically been very product-oriented more into a functional structure. So. Um, we announced the last couple days, and so you can see it on the floor here, um, Unisphere, which is you know, our, our common uh, management uh, 
element manager, we call it, for the mid-range products. And so we had a strategy, we had a vision that we had too many different ways of managing our infrastructure and we needed to bring them together. So that was our strategy and now we've organized in that way. So we've actually taken the management groups that were in these separate product lines and brought them together. When you think about our block, our Clarion product offering, and our Solara, our file offering, we've actually brought those groups together as well. And so you see us bringing these disparate technologies together, both from a strategic, from a code base, and now from a people perspective. And that allows us to really drive a common vision and strategy forward and have the strategy aligned to the organization so that we can execute. And EMC is all about execution and building great products. Yeah, what, what is the impetus behind that? Can you give us some insight there? Is it, is it customer demand? Is it, is it response to the success, for instance, of, of NetApp? Is it the technology is now you know, coming together? Talk a little bit about it, that. It's probably all those things, David. I mean, I think um, you know, one, of our, one of our biggest challenges, I think, as technology people is that we're so focused on the technology and the features that we need to kind of bridge that gap. We need to be sure that our R&D investments are creating business value. You hear that a lot. Um, you know, we have, I have thousands and thousands of engineers in my organization. We can build a lot of technology. We can probably build more technology than people could possibly consume. And so our challenge is, how do we build the right technology that creates business value and deliver to them in a way they can actually consume it? And so we really need to think more strategically about the business problems and to really align our strategy and organizations to go do that. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, virtualization. Um, we, ESG just released a study. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, they shared some of the data with, with us um, uh, around uh, shares in virtualization. I was surprised. I had figured, okay, you're, you're number one in the mid-range, however you define that, whatever IDC price bands you use. Sure. I had assumed, okay, virtualization opens it up. You know, it opens the playing field mm -hmm. up. I was surprised to see that you guys were number one in virtualization. Right. Um, now, I don't know if the shares were the same or larger or small, but they were comparable. Mm -hmm. um, talk about that a little bit. I mean, why are you number one in virtualization from a market share standpoint? So, it, it's multiple things. I th you know, Joe Tutucci, the CEO of the company, is very, very focused. Obviously, he's chairman of both companies. And, you know, enabling this next generation data center, cloud infrastructure, is fundamental to the corporate strategy. And, and so we drive very, very aggressively to support and actually accelerate the adoption of those technologies. So, you know, we announced here in the last couple days and demonstrated on the floor some 60s, 67, 68 integration points with yeah. VMware. It's ridiculous. It's, I mean, it's crazy. It's, yeah. And we really want it to be seamless. So we want that experience to be seamless. The other thing is that that's very, very important from a technology perspective is to understand that historically storage subsystem people have been very focused on, you know, SANS or, you know, or SIFs or NFS, but, but in the virtualized world, the control functions, the not what we call the data path versus the control functions are more and more important. And so we have significant investments and significant focus um, in really enabling the services that VMware provides uh, with and, and using our products. Yeah, I have, I, I, I'd like to give you my opinion on this if I may. So, sure. you know, when we started this business, right, IBM was number one, right? right. They, they, right. Own, they dominate everything, they right. were the low risk bet. Right. I think EMC today and storage is the low risk bet, and, and, but there's more than that. You guys do a great job of of these, what you call proven solutions. Yes. And that takes a lot of risk away yes. From, yes. The, from the customers. The other difference I think is that, unlike the industry when IBM was there, right. it's way more competitive today. And yes. you guys are insanely competitive. Yes. Yes. So do you, I mean, do you buy that premise? No, I think, I think you're onto something really big there. I mean, um, the, the idea that people want to buy integrated solutions is why we, we partnered with VMware and Cisco around the VC Alliance. It's why we've created this joint venture uh, to really enable you know, a single face to the customer, uh, the Acadia investment with uh, Cisco and, and, uh, um, and EMC, to really create a, an integrated solution that people want to buy. I was just at lunch, sat down at a random table with some customers, and uh, the, the amount, of, amount of interest in VCE and, and our V-Block technology is, and so people want to buy that way. You know, there's just, again, so much complexity that by integrating our technology and solutions, which is why it's so important for us to have these, this control path, these native integrations into VMware, um, to make ourselves more and more application oriented in, in how we build Rich. and deliver products to market. Rich, um, a lot of the conversation we've had with other experts has been about cloud forward, right? So, you know, everyone's buying clouds here. Um, it's about going forward and what's going to innovate going forward. 
you mentioned you can look at a lot of different technologies, but you, you have to figure out what to build. It's kind of right. an integrated, makes total sense, I buy that. Right. Question for you is, obviously m and has been a huge activity. We're seeing all that stuff going on, new approaches, startups are coming out. So R&D has been a big point. So you, 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 run, you run that organization, you're, you get, you're the captain at the wheel, what are you, how do you looking at that R&D? Because you have to be selective in how you're doing your R&D, you got acquisition strategies. What's your angle on that in your opinion? And just kind of, what's a vision there? Just sure. Opinion. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's multiple things there. I mean, you know, any big or engineering organization uh, can actually can never do all the things they want to do. I mean, it's, it's kind of a dichotomy, right? So you have to have a set of priorities, right? And so what are our priorities? I mean, first and foremost, uh, first, second, third priority is quality. I mean, just how the world we live in, our stuff is expected to work at scale, you know, if you're going to work in the cloud, it has to work at scale. It has to have five nines of more availability, it's serviceable, it's be supportable, et cetera. That's the first, second, and third priority, and we're known for that, and that's you know, a key part of our proposition. But in parallel to that, you need to simplify, you need to get more application oriented. And so you know, those priorities trickle down into the organization, and, and you, you know, um, so you have kind of the core priorities. And then outside of the core priorities, you want to really bet in a few strategic areas both organically and inorganically. And so you want to have your core strategy and you want to have some adjacencies because you, you never predict the future precisely and you want to, you want to push the envelope uh, on innovation and keep a kind of a healthy balance of kind of routine development, keep your quality up, build the next product, but create some groundbreaking capabilities. We just announced fast cash which is a phenomenal capability. The only mid-range system, frankly the only system in the world to have this capability is Clarion. And I got some email just the other day, yesterday, from a rep, uh, one of our big telco customers, came back and said they're seeing 4X the transactions per second in their billing system from a software upgrade to their existing Clarion. That's groundbreaking, revolutionary stuff. And then, then you got to think about inorganic stuff as well. Right? So yeah, the world spins in any different direction. Exactly. You don't know what's going to happen. Exactly, so you know, have a core strategy, look for adjacencies, you know, break some glass, do some things differently organically as well as inorganically. Dave, what are you seeing in the Wikibon community from customers? You, you got 10,000 know, practitioners in your organization um, on the Wiki. 15,000. 15,000 in your organization. Yep, I mean, yep, customers 15, are chiming in, kind of a back channel. Grown. You're, you're so, so what are they saying? I mean, they, they, you know, I'll see, they yep. agreeing with the unified message? And you know, there's a huge simplicity theme. There's no doubt about it. Simplicity and efficiency are big, big overriding themes. But the, I have to say, the other thing we're seeing is, there are a certain set of customers, and there are a lot of them, that aren't, don't want to sacrifice um, their mission critical operations for you know, the potential of, of unification, right? So they, a lot of customers, I don't know if you see this, Rich, mm -hmm. are fencing off their mm -hmm. block from their file, and they're happy with that, at least for now. Sure. You know, they create a NAST here, and they're saying, hey, you know what, it works fine. We're creating business value in other ways. There's another segment of customers that it's really just driven by cost cutting and efficiency, and those are the guys that are really you know, clamoring for unification. How do you see it? Ah, I think you see both, both camps. I think you see, um, you know, when you look at virtualization, uh, the idea that, um, you know, the idea that if you think about VMDKs and virtualization, those are all file-oriented semantic, semantics. Yeah. So you see you know, performance-oriented, low-latency things around the block, and then you see more and more unstructured data, whether it be VMDKs or user data around the file, and so we, we see these infrastructures coming together really in both ways. And there's no question that the file is, you know, it's whosever numbers you look at, dramatically outgrowing the block, <laughs> and so you got to address that, right? So, can I just kind of change gears a little bit because we got Rich on, have some fun. So, so at EMC World, he gave some advice for people, so, so uh, there was a nice clip, and actually got a lot of traffic, so, uh, you know, <laughs> to the entrepreneurs out there. So, Today, you know, what, um, you know, putting on the, you know, the, the hat of experience, been there, done that, you run a big organization, huge entrepreneurial activity going on, and this is more of a VMware kind of story. I mean, mm -hmm. they're saying $1 of license is $15 of, of ecosystem revenue, essentially the Microsoft model. Right. I mean, it's going to be a gravy train of innovation and, and money making, right. you know, companies right. getting public. Right. A lot of entrepreneurs out there spinning up apps, Apple's got the big announcement. What advice do you say now, you know, to add to that, how to approach their business, how to get funding, it's just, you know, just <laughs> advice, what Boy, you that, tell that, them? That's an hour, at least a conversation. <laughs> um, so I would say that um, 
it, it, it's a Chinese curse, but you know, we live in interesting times, right? And, uh, but I think in, in these interesting times, there's so much change. In, in consumption models of technology around you know enablements of things you know whether it be solid state flash or or Intel's processors or the speed of networks and you know so many new entrants in the marketplace it's a very very rich time so I th I'd say my first point of advice is be bold right be bold because it's really not clear what the outcome is going to be um, I would also say that um, you know if you're you know growing entrepreneur uh, you know, know, know what you're good at, right? I see a lot of my friends who want to start companies, they, they have kind of lots of ideas, but there's no unique insight because they're actually not expert enough to really have a unique insight. So I would say play to your strengths, not your weaknesses, right? If you're an ex expert in a particular technology, whether it be, you know, internet or service providers or chips or operating system software or applications, play to your strength and look for a unique, a unique idea where you have a unique insight that's really kind of beyond the horizon and don't be afraid to go after it because what do you have to lose? Awesome, so I had one last question for you. You run a big organization that's growing at the epicenter of technology. If three par is worth two billion, what's your organization worth? <laughs> <laughs> well, multiple revenue, a very, very big number. A very, very big number. <laughs> No Where comment he, there? I can't comment. Yeah. We, don't, we don't unbundle the, uh, the earnings or revenues uh, that way. Well, you startups out there, Rich DiPolitano's great advice there. EMC, uh, he's going to be buying companies uh, and uh, doing I didn't say that. I didn't say um, that. That's our prediction. Uh, our prediction. Uh -huh. uh, be bold and create new opportunities so that EMCs and the big guys can buy you, uh, I guess is, is my Do advice. Do something interesting. Um, they're always looking. some white space. Um, EMC, the leader, number one in storage virtualization um, and just kicking butt pulling the unified story together, VMware enabling all that through their relationship. So uh, we're excited to have you. We're here, SiliconANGLE, the Cube, coverage exclusively live from San Francisco, California at VMworld 2010. We'll be right back. Great. Thanks, Thank Rich. you, take care. Okay.